Hello everyone. Welcome back to Vantage Pharmacology. Here's wishing you all a very happy and prosperous 2021. In this tutorial, we'll be discussing hypertension, the pathophysiological aspects, the various antihypertensive drugs and the management of hypertension. Please do not skip the pathophysiology as it's very important to understand the pathophysiology so that learning about the drugs becomes more easier. Since hypertension is a very big topic, we'll be covering the topic in three or four videos. In this video, we'll be stopping with thiazide-like diuretics. Hypertension is a very important UG topic. It's often asked as an essay or short note. Blood pressure is a product of cardiac output and peripheral vascular resistance. The cardiac output is determined by heart rate and stroke volume, whereas the peripheral vascular resistance is determined by the vessel diameter and blood viscosity. So when you design an antihypertensive drug, most of these drugs act either by reducing the cardiac output or by reducing the peripheral vascular resistance. Now let's look into a bit of physiology. Let's see how blood pressure is regulated in the body. There are two mechanisms by which blood pressure is regulated. One is called as a baroreceptor mechanism and the other the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Let's firstly look into the baroreceptor mechanism. This mechanism is responsible for moment-to-moment -moment control of the blood pressure. The receptor is located in the carotid sinus and the aortic arch. And the center, which is the vasomotor center, is located in the medulla. I've already mentioned that the baroreceptor reflex is responsible for moment-to-moment -moment adjustment of the blood pressure. Say, for example, you're lying down and you suddenly get up. So what happens here? There is pooling of blood in the large veins of the leg and this results in reduction of the cardiac output and subsequently a fall in blood pressure. But yet, you don't feel dizzy, isn't it? So how is that possible? Here comes the role of the baroreceptor reflex. Pooling of blood below the level of heart would cause a reduced stretch in the carotid sinus and the aortic arch. And this would disinhibit the vasomotor center. And subsequently, there is an increased sympathetic outflow and thus restoring the blood pressure. And conversely, when there is a reduced stretch of the carotid sinus and the aortic arch, the vasomotor center is inhibited and thus reducing the central sympathetic outflow and hence reducing the blood pressure. So this is how the baroreceptor reflex helps in moment-to-moment -moment control of the blood pressure. Now we look into something that is responsible for long-term control of the blood pressure. That is the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. The center of this is the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidney. If the blood pressure is reduced, there is reduction in the renal perfusion. And this would stimulate the release of renin from the juxtaglomerular cells. Renin is responsible for conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is in turn converted to angiotensin 2 with the help of the enzyme angiotensin converting enzyme. Angiotensin 2 is a powerful vasoconstrictor. Apart from that, this also stimulates the release of aldosterone which causes salt and water retention and also the release of norepinephrine. All of this serves to increase the blood pressure. When do you say someone has hypertension? When the systolic BP is more than or equal to 140 millimeter of mercury and or the diastolic BP is more than or equal to 90 millimeter of mercury. Based on the JNC 8 guidelines 
for people who are more than or equal to 60 years of age, the treatment should be started only when the BP is more than or equal to 150 bar 90 millimeter of mercury. So how do you diagnose hypertension clinically? So let's see what are the main symptoms of hypertension. Hypertension is a silent killer. That means it is mostly asymptomatic unless and until it presents as an end organ damage. The patient can remain asymptomatic for ages and can present to the emergency department as case of stroke or as a coronary artery disease or in heart failure or as a case of cardiomyopathy. It can also present as a chronic kidney disease and as retinopathy. Looking into the etiology of hypertension, hypertension can be essential or primary hypertension wherein the cause of hypertension is unknown or it is idiopathic. Secondary hypertension where you have a well-defined cause. It can be renovascular, adrenal or due to some endocrine pathology. Management of hypertension. Management basically involves some lifestyle changes and drug therapy. Lifestyle modifications include salt restrictions, avoiding junk and oily food, including more of vegetables and whole cereals in your diet, include yoga and exercise into your daily activities. Drug therapy of hypertension. Antihypertensive drugs include diuretics, RAS inhibitors, sympathetic inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, and vasodilators. Let's first have a look into diuretics. Different classes of diuretics used in the management of hypertension includes loop diuretics, thiazide-like diuretics, and aldosterone antagonists. The role of diuretics as an antihypertensive drug. Diuretics act by reducing the cardiac output. Let's see how. Diuretics causes natriuresis. Thus, it reduces the plasma volume and hence it reduces cardiac output and thus the blood pressure. Thiazide-like diuretics. Few examples of drugs from this group include hydrochlorothiazide, chlorthalidone and indepamide. They are considered as one of the first line drugs in the management of hypertension. Mechanism of action is inhibition of sodium chloride sympoter in the distal tubule. The rationale of thiazides as an antihypertensive drug. The initial reduction in blood pressure is due to diuresis which reduces the cardiac output. Later on, the compensatory mechanism comes into play and thus the sodium and plasma volume is restored. But on long-term usage, fallen BP is due to reduction in total peripheral resistance because of a small persisting deficit in sodium volume, thus improving the vessel wall compliance and decreased responsiveness to vasoconstrictors. Advantages of using thiazide-like diuretics as antihypertensives. These group of drugs have a longer duration of action compared to loop diuretics, permitting once daily dosing. They have a flat dose response curve, meaning there are less chance of electrolyte imbalances and other adverse effects. There is no tolerance or fluid retention. The chances of postural hypotension is very low because the sympathetic system and the baroreceptor reflexes are spared. The loss of calcium in urine is inhibited, thus making thiazides beneficial in postmenopausal women who are especially susceptible to osteoporosis. Main drawbacks of thiazide-like diuretics include electrolyte imbalances like hyperkalemia and hyponatremia, which is less marked when compared to that of lube diuretics. Erectile dysfunction, which is an idiosyncratic reaction, 
that is it cannot be explained by the mechanism of action of thiazides metabolic side effects like dyslipidemia and glucose intolerance and hyperuricemia many of these adverse effects can be prevented by giving lower doses of thiazides the loop diuretics some of the examples of loop diuretics include furosemide tyrosemide and bumetanide these drugs act by inhibiting the sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter in the thick ascending limb of loop of henle and these drugs causes reduction in blood pressure by reducing the plasma volume due to diuresis why despite being highly efficacious loop diuretics aren't the first choice in the management of hypertension this is because of the shorter duration of action of loop diuretics sodium deficit is not maintained round the clock because of the compensatory increase in sodium absorption from the proximal convoluted tubule and these drugs are more liable to cause electrolyte imbalances when compared to that of thiazide like diuretics loop diuretics are preferred in hypertensives with chronic kidney disease where thiazide like diuretics are ineffective or in patients with comorbidities like heart failure which warrants the use of loop diuretics aldosterone antagonists like spironolactone and epilirinone these group of drugs are used in conjunction with thiazide like diuretics to compensate for the potassium loss they also augment the antihypertensive effect of thiazides so in this tutorial we have discussed how blood pressure is being regulated in the body about the various classes of antihypertensive drugs that are being used and under that we have only discussed diuretics under diuretics you have loop diuretics thiazide like diuretics and aldosterone antagonists The loop diuretics and aldosterone antagonists are only used as adjuvants, whereas thiazide-like diuretics are the main class of antihypertensive drugs. They are one of the first-line drugs in the management of hypertension. Thiazide-like diuretics are preferred because, compared to loop diuretics, the chances of hypokalemia and other metabolic side effects are lesser because the dose of thiazides as an antihypertensive is much lower than that when thiazides are used as diuretics if you like this video please give a thumbs up and don't forget to like share and subscribe for more videos